You're still here with us on the Joy Change Speaker Series, and you have been listening to um, our speakers inspire us and seek to impact us, influence us, our thoughts and our conduct. And as some of you have been sending your messages and saying that the conscience of duty bearers are being pricked so that they will sit up and do the right things. Let's now go to listen to the topic, Redefining Our Democracy for Accelerated Development, Constitutional Reforms Now. Looking forward, imperatives for agriculture and food. Very important to look at. And who is our next speaker. He's an agronomist and was the candidate of the Convention People's Party for the 2012 elections, during which he was described by many as winner of the presidential debate. He is chairman of Sackforce Holdings Limited and founder of the National Interest Movement. He has for a while now been pushing for constitutional change like Fix the Country is doing. Dr. Michael Abu Sakara Foster, thank you very much for making time to speak to us. Thank you so much. And uh, I must first of all congratulate you on this innovative program. Thank you. And giving voice to the many and the majority who are often silent uh, and perhaps uh, in this program you can hear them speaking. That's right. Uh, because people are not shouting over each other. And that has been one of the, my pleasant surprises here today mm -hmm. uh, that I have enjoyed it so much. In Thank fact, you. Uh, I, I want to congratulate you on that. Thank you. Not to mention our last uh, speaker who mm -hmm. was so eloquent she reminded me of somebody. <laughs> yes. Uh, Dr. Abu Sakara says that she re, uh, Afi uh, Agbenyo's presentation reminds him of uh, Chimamanda. <laughs> right. Yes. Hmm. So uh, to the issue of redefining our democracy, uh, I think throughout this morning, my task has been made easier because almost all the presenters after making their presentations, have traced the source of our tribulations back to the Constitution. And I think for us uh, in the national interest movement, this is a very important pivotal moment because it shows that persistence over a period of more than six years has brought the issue of constitutional reforms uh, from the rear to the front, where it is now part of the national discourse. Mm. And so many actors are joining hands uh, to push for what we are asking for now, which is a referendum before the next election. And the circumstances demand this. Both the internal circumstances in the country and of course the external circumstances in the world around us. And we cannot have the luxury of continuing business as usual when all around us we see all the familiar things, a mileposts that we were so comfortable with falling over and changing, almost as if the very earth we stand on itself was moving from under our feet. It will be folly to continue to do business as usual. And that is why, after 30 years of the 1992 Constitution, we must reform the Constitution now, and we must have a referendum before the next election. My presentation is going to focus on how we need, why we need to do that, and how we can do it. But I will first like to recap on some of the reasons of why, <laughs> you know, because just to refresh our memory so that it is put in a broader context. Our 
organization is a nonpartisan organization, and we are focused on constitutional reforms for the past six years. Uh, based on past and current consultative processes uh, that are more or less captured in the uh, Constitutional Review Report, but also captured in the presentations of CSOs, uh, many of them who have also presented today. So it is not a novel idea. Mm. It is a burgeoning demand that our political actors have refused to listen to it. And why have they refused to listen to it? Because they have been caught up in the quagmire of a stagnant duopoly, where only the politics of equalization is what is heard. And I'm glad that you've given the opportunity for another view to be heard, which is actions for the progress out of the quagmire. And in focusing on those constitutional reforms. They are key areas. They are not exclusive to us. They are shared because they will have pervasive impact if you make those constitutional changes. And we've narrowed them down to seven, but they are by no means exhaustive. exhaustive. Mm. The key one you have heard, which is to redress the imbalance in the power between the arms of states. Many people call it excessive you know, uh, powers of the presidency, but it goes beyond that because there are institutional aspects of it that we need to deal with. I'm not going to go into too much detail in those today because I want to cover ground and get to the imperative of why we must make those changes. But it's fair to say that the major purpose of this would be to resolve the conflicts of interest vis-a-vis -vis the legislative and the judiciary. And we all know what that means in their appointments and also in the appointment of ministers from the legislative, not to mention the control of budgets. You know, so we need to re uh, rectify that. We also need to uh, resolve the conflict of interest of Article 71 holders where more or less you ask me to approve my own salary, you know, uh, and my conditions of emoluments. Of course, it will be disproportional to the rest of the, of the people. So we want adjustment in those as well, in terms of the reforms that we seek. Now, uh, when we rationalize those emoluments, uh, we will then have a basis for saying from the income generated, what is relevant to pay a particular person down to the last person. When you don't pay heed to the income we generate and you just start dishing out, of course, it will become like irrigation from Accra to Volgatanga. You know, the first few meters will be over, overly soaked, but from Kumasi going on will be dry. <laughs> and that's what happens in terms of emoluments and remuneration of peoples in the, in, the, uh, in the populace. And then you don't get the buy-in that you want other people to have. So I think we have to be very clear about that. Mm. We also have to be clear about accountable political representation at the local government level on a non-partisan basis. This is the last front where we can say enough the political parties have already taken up all the space. Leave the small space of local government for the general populace to elect their leaders on non-partisan basis so that party machinery cannot override the choices of individuals. That is very important. And I cannot state enough that the general feeling of the populace is in support of non-partisan representation, because not only does it give us somebody who is, belongs to all of us, and we all feel included, uh, but also it allows us to begin the process of experimenting with an alternative form of representation that we can grow organically from the grassroots level, and we hope it will even virtually come to a balance mm. with the partisan one we have adopted at higher levels.
So it is very important and should not be dismissed lightly. Associated with that is also the imbalance of resource allocation between the center and local governments. We must come to a stage in our constitution where a fixed percentage of the revenue, not less than 25% and possibly 35%, is shared by a known formula amongst local governments based on population size and uh, level of infrastructure development and also a catch-up factor given as additional conditional grant for investing in specific areas that will help those behind to catch up. We cannot just hope by broadcasting the seeds from Accra that the field will be equally germinated. It isn't. We've tried it for so many years. In fact, what we have is a migration from the rural areas into Accra, creating even more problems for infrastructure here. So you've got to do something deliberate. You cannot just do the usual things and hope for something different. Associated with that, you have to ask yourself the question, where are we now with local government in the middle of no man's land? Yeah. Do we want autonomous local governments? Or don't we? And if we do, are we going to make them financially independent, give them an economy of scale, and also give them accountable leadership? These three things must go together. And I think that we now have too many districts for us to be able to budget for them and for them to be autonomous. And the scale, uh, in terms of the, 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 the economy of scale, they're too small. So we now need to take the bold step of saying, we've tried this, it's had good effects, we can keep the good parts and then eliminate the bad parts. Let us bring back local government to regional level and have about 30, re uh, 30 regions and have local government housed there. Still elect the local government executive on non-partisan basis, so we are like a, a regional governor instead of a regional minister, and he will have his budget, which we have you know, consigned to him uh, 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 by virtue of our uh, constitutional allocation. That way, not only will we be able to recenter local government where it has scope for growth, an economy of scale to grow, a tax base to develop uh, and, and exist in reality, and not just wait for government subventions, but also we will be housing it where a higher caliber of technical and professional expertise will be happy to live and serve. And we have to be realistic in that you cannot get some of these highly qualified people to go and live and work in some of these existing districts. So, and in any case, we don't have enough of them. So by reducing the number from 260, whatever it is now, to 30, you would be able to reallocate from the center enough people to live in these areas, form a hub, to be able to execute local government uh, together with their regional uh, 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 local government executive. Now, what that would also mean is that the parliamentarians would now need to graduate from looking after constituencies and representing constituencies before they come into the executive at the regional level. And from the regional level, you have a way of electing, selecting those that you want to go to the national level. This business of jumping people who perhaps have never seen 5,000 Ghana CDs in an envelope, all the way to look after billions of CDs in the ministry, is ridiculous and we must stop it because it doesn't make common sense. You grow people through experience and through capacity. You don't just jump them into positions and then when you get the results you don't want, you start complaining. Yeah. So we must inbuild the system of growing and maturing a leadership and administrative capacity embedded in the system itself. And that will eliminate the business of DCs and MPs always holding each other's shirts at election, who is going to be the MP, you know, and who, because it translates into who might be a minister. All those things are resolved. Now, on the issue of our electoral laws, I'm pleased today to have seen my 
I don't know whether to call him my son or my political <laughs> son or my biological son, Ernesto, I start to focus on key areas. And I thought he made a very brilliant submission on the need for electoral reforms and electoral representation and also a first-past-the-post system, which is one of the key elements of uh, the seven-point agenda in terms of broadening representation. Uh, we advocate for the formation of coalition governments. You can use any kind of system you want. We can evolve it ourselves. Mm. But the formation of coalition governments will eliminate the need to go for a second round after the first round of elections. Now, we ourselves can decide what kind of proportional representation we want, etc. After all, when the British flag came down, nobody asked us what kind of representation we wanted. We just adopted the, uh, the British parliamentary system. Mm -hmm. So now we have a chance to evolve our own. Right. And it is very important that we do that. Uh, now, the other reason why we want to do this mm -hmm. It's also because of the winner-takes-all phenomenon. So if you may speak to one last... Uh... Yes. Well, the, the, uh, uh, the adoption of a long-term national development plan, I think, is very important because it moves us from short-term thinking mm. to long-term thinking. And also, it obviates the need for us to keep improvising manifestos based on promises uh, that we can't keep anyway, mm. uh, to manifestos based on milestones within the National Development Plan for a certain segment of uh, development at that time, based on our realistic income at that time. So manifestos will no longer be promises. They'll be basically reading of budget statements. If you promise to do A, B, C, and D, mm. how are you going to pay for it? And that is a question we have never asked politicians okay. in Ghana, and we must do that. All right. But I would like to finish, lastly, on talking about the reasons why mm. we must have a referendum before the next election. It will take away many mm. of the things that we have been struggling with and ensure that this post-independence generation mm. is able to bequeath to the fourth Republican generation, a constitution that will expand their horizons, mm. allow them to grow and enhance development and remove all the roadblocks that have become entrenched interests right. of the political elite. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Abu Sakara Foster. He's been speaking on redefining our democracy for accelerated development, constitutional reforms now looking forward imperatives for agriculture, food security, and economic growth.